Hey everybody, welcome back. It is Antietam 160. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. I'm Gary Edelman. I'll introduce our guest in just a sec, but you know who he is already. And not only that, you already probably know where we are. We are above the Lower Bridge or Rohrbach Bridge or Burnside Bridge. But like we've been doing for Antietam 160, let's take a slightly different tact on this, at least as we start. So Dennis Fry, I think you already know who he is, one of the co-founders of the American Battlefield Trust been given tours here for 50 or 60 years already. That's actually already. true. Yeah, yeah. 50, you were like 50, 14. Thir 13, 14, first tours. All right. Well, yeah. Dennis, take it away and do your thing. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. And again, I want to thank all, all you members of the American Battlefield Trust for allowing us to preserve places like this. You've heard me say it over and again, but I mean it sincerely. None of us save the battlefields by ourselves. It's taken all of us together collectively over now 35 years or so to do this work. And we really appreciate you sustaining us and allowing us, enabling us to continue these fine works as uh, we're still not finished yet. When I was president of the American Battlefield Trust, I used to say, my favorite day will be when we go out of business and we will go out of business when there's no more battlefield land to save. Well, we're far from going out of business. We have a lot of land to save and we need you to stay, keep us staying in business so we can continue to preserve these precious places. Well, to the point, Burnside Bridge. I'm gonna tell you about this before it is Burnside Bridge, before it is named Burnside Bridge, before Burnside attacks here, before Burnside is even given orders to attack here. This is really important. And this story that I'm about to share with you ties into another story that you've already heard. So you'll be able to connect the pieces of the puzzle. It's another fascinating aspect of this story is that very seldom is it actually told. And this may be new to you. You may not know of what I'm just about to share. So when you come to Burnside Bridge, typically your eyes go down. If you're up here where the Georgians, and we're on the Georgian Overlook, we're at the position that Benning's Georgians were holding the position. You're up here, you look down. You look down on the bridge, you're up at high elevation. Well, you should, because that's the object of interest. That's the object of focus. But I want you to change your focus for a moment. Instead of looking down on the bridge, I want you to take your eyes and I want you to look up. I want you to look up. Look up towards the tree branch and see what you see in the distance. You see that mountaintop, the crest of that hill? That's Red Hill. And Red Hill is really important to what happens here at Burnside Bridge. Now, it's not close. It's the highest promontory overlooking this area, but it's not close. I mean, that's over a mile from here. But what happens on Red Hill and what happens here bring us the story of Burnside Bridge and the attack that Burnside launches here. So what am I leading to? Well, remember when we were up near the Dunker Church and in the West Woods, and we were speaking about the advance of General Walker's division, John Walker's division? arriving on the field to assist with the attacks and help lead defend the Westwood sector. Remember that? Well, this is where Walker was. This is where he was. That division of Confederates was almost 4,000 strong. And that division of Confederates had come here from Harper's Ferry. Special Orders 191 had sent Walker to Harper's Ferry with Jackson. He had taken Loudon Heights overlooking the Shenandoah River. I've already shared that story with you. Then on the 16th, 15th, 16th of September, they march, they arrive pretty early on the 16th before noon and Lee's looking around at his line and this area here is very weak. We don't have enough Confederates down here. And so Lee sends Walker's division down here to this sector, the Southern sector of the battlefield. Now we've got with other Confederates holding this area, we've got over five, thousand Confederates in position here. And what a position of defense. I mean, with 5,000 Confederates, we can hold this position. You're not coming across that bridge. But Lee now has an emergency. Early in the morning of the 17th, there's no action down here. It's pretty quiet. There's a little bit of artillery, sporadic artillery fire back and forth across the creek, but it's quiet. There's no infantry fire. And as time goes on now, seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning. The fighting has been raging to the north. That direction now, oh, almost uh, two and a half, three miles from here, the cornfield, the east woods, the west woods. And so Lee, desperate, 
desperate for manpower to support his weakened lines to the north, where all the action's been, sends a message down here to General Walker and says, okay, we need you to move. Bring your division, move from this sector and head up towards the Dunker Church in the West Woods. So Walker acts on it immediately. Nine o'clock in the morning, he starts pulling out of here. 4,000 Confederates start to march north from this point. Well, guess who sees it? You can't move 4,000 people without being seen. So that's the reason we go from down at the bridge to up to the top of the mountain. Because on Red Hill, McClellan's got a signal station, an observatory, what we might think of today as a modern satellite in the sky. He can see, not him himself, but his forces can see what's happening down here. And so as 4,000 Confederates begin trudging to the north, they take note of that. And they're going to send a message to McClellan talking about this maneuver. That's around 9 o'clock in the morning. George doesn't hesitate to jump into action. 9-10, 9-10. Just enough time for them to decode that signal so that McClellan knows what's going on. George McClellan is writing out an order for Ambrose Burnside. Attack, attack, 9, 10 in the morning. So you can see the correlation here. Walker's moving. A mass number of Confederates is leaving, departing, heading to the north leaving very few, a minimal number of Confederates here in a defensive position. That movement is seen from the Red Hill Signal Station. McClellan is notified by signal and McClellan sends orders to Burnside to assault the bridge, to hit this place because most of the Confederates have left. 90% of the Confederates down here in this area have taken off. Now we still have rebels, we still have Georgians, and we're still going to, now we're going to have a fight. But it's really important to understand that one reason McClellan had not ordered Burnside to assault down here was because this area is heavily defended. There are a whole lot of Confederates crowding this area, and it would have been a suicide mission for Burnside to attempt to get across the creek at that point. Pull those Confederates out because Lee is desperate, Lee needs them elsewhere, and all of a sudden, George McClellan has an opportunity. So as, as Dennis talked about uh, with the, uh, the ground down here as the Confederates leave, let's talk about what the Confederates left behind here. And really just south of Sharpsburg, uh, running from Cemetery Hill where the National Cemetery sits today at Antietam, to a ridge line about three quarters of a mile west of Burnside Bridge. All that's here is the division of David R. Jones, neighbor Jones, as he was known to his friends, and uh, Jones' division was only about 2,400 men total that he had. So Lee has stripped, as Dennis talked about, pretty much everything from his right to send up to the northern end of the battlefield, and that's the opportunity that McClellan sees to then begin uh, ordering Burnside to attack the bridge and to assault the bridge. Now there are three movements, essentially, that Burnside wants to initiate, or, or does initiate during the course of the morning and early afternoon of the 17th, to try and take this bridge. But firstly, again, looking at the terrain here, for those of you who have been here, you can see on the video how high up we are above the bridge. We're not even at the top of this ridge line where the 2nd and 20th Georgia was positioned of Robert Toombs' brigade, directly under the command here of Henry Benning. But it's about a 70-foot bluff that uh, Union troops had to face upon making it to the west side of the creek and across the bridge itself. So this is a strong position, and that was something that Ambrose Burnside was aware of, notifying how, how strong uh, this position is. So a couple of things that he had done is really to plan on a, a two-pronged approach to the bridge itself. Trying to take the bridge directly in front of the Georgians here, but then also he sent a division of about 3,000 men under the command of Isaac Rodman downstream to my left to try and find a crossing point downstream from the bridge. Now there were rumors and information that had been supplied to Burnside and McClellan that there was a ford about a quarter of a mile downstream from the bridge itself. And so that is where Rodman was heading. 
But while Rodman was moving in that direction, Burnside was going to stage movements against the bridge uh, to keep the Confederates' attention fixed here on the bridge itself and on the majority of the Ninth Corps troops across the creek. The first attack to go forward went forward at about 10 a.m. It was under the command of George Crook and uh, also Henry Kingsbury, who was the brother-in-law of David R. Jones here. So you have brothers-in-law fighting against each other here at Antietam. Uh, the 11th Connecticut was supposed to support Crook's Ohioans. Now, orders got mixed up, information wasn't relayed correctly, and Crook's men ended up about 350 yards north of the bridge itself, so not even striking the bridge, leaving the 440 men of the 11th Connecticut to face the fire of about 400 Georgians positioned up here on this 70-foot high bluff and spread up and down the stream as well. The Connecticut men are going to suffer heavy casualties, about a third of their regiment will become casualties, including its commanding officer, Henry Kingsbury, who will be struck multiple times, and he struck one last time as he's actually being carried from the field. So that first attempt to carry the bridge did not succeed. Rodman was encountering problems of himself going downstream, trying to find that crossing point, because the crossing point that was there was a ford, certainly, but it was not a good one to get 3,000 men in the military across. Also, the bluffs on the west bank of the Antietam were very steep down there, and so Rodman had to continue moving further downstream to find another place to cross. In the meantime, George McClellan was becoming frustrated with Burnside, uh, who was not, uh, had not taken the bridge at this point, so a second attack was ordered forward. This uh, was made up of two regiments, the 2nd Maryland and 6th New Hampshire, that would use the road on the other side, the sharpsburg Roarsville Road on the other side of the creek, uh, in a basically an attack column. Those troops, the Marylanders and New Hampshire men, would move up the road as we're looking at it from right to left under cover of federal infantry and artillery that was lining the bluffs on the opposite side of the creek to keep the heads of these Georgians down. And in the meantime, then, those two regiments would be able to storm across the bridge, ideally. However, the vegetation that you see in front of you, there was much less of it at the time. There was still some vegetation here, but the Confederates had much better fields of fire to the opposite side of the creek. And so that second attack uh, falls apart before they even make it to the bridge itself. Now the third, and what ultimately proves to be the final Federal attempt to take the bridge, went forward a little bit after noon. And it's important to note here too, uh, so much has been made, especially in the past, of phases of the Battle of Antietam, of a morning phase, a midday phase, and an afternoon phase. But all of this fighting is going on while the fighting's going on at the Sunken Road, and some of it is still going on around the Dunker Church West Woods area as well. But that third attack was led by Edward Ferrero, uh, his brigade. Two regiments were specifically selected, the 51st Pennsylvania and the 51st New York. Lore says, and I believe it to be true, that uh, the Pennsylvanians asked to have their whiskey ration restored before taking the bridge, and if they did take the bridge, that they would have it restored, and Ferrero was fired up and said that, uh, yes, he would do that. So the 251st came charging down a small ravine on the other side of the creek in column, and as they were basically supposed to replicate what the 2nd Maryland and 6th New Hampshire were supposed to do. They were not supposed to stop and fire. However, ultimately, when they came down to the uh, floodplain on the east side of the creek, they get smacked by a wall of fire from these Georgians up here on top of this hill. Natural human inclination is to find a place for cover. So the Pennsylvanians get the better end of that deal. They will use the stone wall running from the north side of the bridge, while the New Yorkers are left to use the post and rail fence lining the sharpsburg Roarsville Road. From cover, those 251st regiments begin to open fire on this hillside, pouring a heck of a lot of lead into the Confederate position here. And by 1 p.m., the slackening of fire coming from this position where we are now was starting to be felt by the enlisted men of the 251st regiments. That slackening of fire could be accounted for for several different reasons. Firstly, the Confederates here, the Georgians, had been fighting for about three hours, starting to run low on ammunition. Also, they were starting to get pressured, not just from Rodman's division, which had crossed about a mile downstream from the bridge at a place called Snavely's Ford, but also some of George Crook's Ohioans that got misplaced in the early morning's action um, about 350 yards north of the bridge were starting to slowly make their way across the creek and work their way towards the left end of the Georgians line here. So the Pennsylvanians and New Yorkers charged across the bridge and right at pretty much 1 p.m. the bridge after about three hours of fighting had been secured by Burnside and his men. 
But that was not the end of the story here at Antietam. And in fact, for as much attention as the bridge gets, and it is probably one of the most iconic landmarks on any American battlefield, the uh, fighting here is relatively, and I use that term lightly because it is the bloodiest single day in American military history, but it's not as bloody, as deadly as the fighting that we saw earlier in the morning at the cornfield, the West Woods, Sunken Road, uh, and the northern end of the battlefield. About 500 Federals will become casualties in the assaults on the bridge. For the Georgians up here, just about 120 casualties overall. But nonetheless, Burnside had the bridge now in his hands that bears his name. But his objective now from here was to push three quarters of a mile west from here and try to seize the high ground uh, on the south end of Sharpsburg. It was where Lee had anchored his right flank earlier that day. So it took Burnside about two hours to get to his 8,000 men that would ultimately be formed up in that line across the creek and then formed up in a mile long line. But by 3 p.m., they were ready to go forward and strike towards the weakened southern end. Again, consisting of just over 2,000 soldiers now at this point for the Confederates um, south of Sharpsburg. And that is what would be called, is termed today as the final attack. So the fighting down here does not end once the bridge is taken. There's a lot more fighting for the Ninth Corps to do over very difficult terrain once they advance into the fields west of the bridge itself as well. Great. Thanks, Kevin. I, God, you said a lot, and I agree with all of it. Uh, that is, I think, the most rough terrain um, on the battlefield. And now I am greeted again with the recumbent Chris White, who has been filming. <laughs> we'll post pictures about this so you can see what he was doing. Um, you know, in terms of the casualties here, this is this iconic place. But if there are six, seven hundred casualties here, we are talking about, you know, fewer than were suffered around the middle bridge. I've heard people say a fifth of what was suffered in the final attack, which was especially blood. So um, iconic and costly don't, don't always match. It's a very picturesque place. And right now I just, it is just beautiful right here uh, to be out here filming, um, in this case, in advance of the anniversary. Um, you know, while we were talking about casualties, I had two I wanted to bring up and, uh, you know, because you've got to get into the human cost. And I'll thank Carol Reardon for her excellent Field Guide to Antietam book, which has all these great vignettes from which I'm, you know, uh, borrowing right now. One guy, he is in the second Georgia. He's up on this ridge somewhere. His name is John Slade. He's a private. We don't know a whole lot about him, but, you know, he had expended his ammunition. He's about to leave the line, but a bullet entered his middle finger. I'll hold it this way. And unfortunately, it didn't just enter the finger. It then went into his stomach and his liver. And he will go to a hospital sometime outside, someplace outside of Sharpsburg. He'll be buried there. And uh, we don't know if he was removed or where he might be. So um, that's it. Another guy fighting against him was in the 51st New York. He's a lieutenant. He is uh, Jacob Beaver uh, of the 51st, and he's charging across. And so apparently this dude is brave and daring. He was in North Carolina in a fight. I think it was at New Bern, and he was seen among the first to get into the enemy's works, dancing on top of the enemy parapet before he actually went in. And then here he comes to Antietam, and he was on the bridge when he is shot um, right in the middle of the face on the bridge itself. He yells, oh, and falls dead on the bridge. He is, uh, you know, later eulogized and somebody said he was young in years, but old in experience. Um, and it's just important when we throw out 600 casualties, you know, of which 150-ish would pay the ultimate price, it's important to keep reading their names and understand this. And we think you all already understand it. So um, let me ask if anybody else is wanting to come in front here. I'm seeing some head shaking. So we got a lot more to do. We're really happy you've been spending some of your time with us here at Burnside Bridge and elsewhere on the field. Make sure you share this with your friends. And like Chris often says, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's easy. When you're on YouTube, you can see that button pretty easy. Subscribe to it if you will. Uh, follow us on Facebook. And like I said, do anything you can if you are able and interested to support battlefield preservation and education. The easiest way to do that, sign up for our emails at battlefields.org, and we hope you're having a meaningful Antietam 160.